Hi, welcome back to My Smart Learning. It's uh, Mr. Mian here with your science lessons and your physics lessons. This is for my year nine classes, uh, but it's useful for year 10s and year 11s too for your GCSE science and physics. So last time uh, we looked at specific heat capacity. We're starting the next chapter, chapter three in the physics textbook on energy resources. So we're going to focus today on non-renewable energy resources and uh, the question or the learning objective what we're looking at is how do we get energy from non-renewable resources but before we start we need to have our quick quiz our recall pt our virtual high five quiz remember you can't buy these in the shop so get all five correct and you get a virtual high five from me so number one what is specific heat capacity number two what is the formula for specific heat capacity e equals what Number three, what is water's C, which stands for specific heat capacity? What's water's specific heat capacity? It's a number you need to know. Do metals or water have a higher specific heat capacity? The C. And number five, how can we investigate the C of a metal? That was the required practical that I was talking about last time. So press pause, have a go at those questions. And if you're ready, you can unpause and we'll go through the answers now. Right, so number one, what is the definition of specific heat capacity? It's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. That's the definition of specific heat capacity. Number two, what is the formula? It's E equals MC theta, which is the energy is equal to, or the change in energy is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. That's what the theta, delta theta represents. Number three, what is water specific heat capacity? It's 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Or you can write it as 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. And do metals or water have a higher C? Water has a higher specific heat capacity compared to metals. And how do we investigate the C for a metal? Uh, that was the required practical that we discussed last time. You get a metal block that is one kilogram in mass. You have a, a hole in there. You put a heating element into that um, metal block. You have a thermometer in that metal block. You switch on the, the power pack because the heating element is connected to the power pack using an ammeter and a voltmeter with a stopwatch and you've got your thermometer there, you take the temperature from zero every minute, so 60 seconds, 120 seconds and so on and so on, you change your time into seconds, you take the voltage, you take the current and you can calculate the energy transferred or the work done into that uh, metal block by using the formula E equals ITV. So the current times the time times the voltage will give you the energy then you've got your temperature change in that time. You plot it on a graph and then you calculate the gradient of that graph. And then you need to do the reciprocal of that, which is one over the, temp, uh, the gradient. And that will give you the specific heat capacity. If that was too much, too quick, have a watch of the, uh, the video from previous. Um, and there are other uh, teachers online on YouTube doing the required practical. So you can have a look at them specifically doing that lesson on the required practical. You guys will have a chance to do that probably uh, next year now because the chances of us doing practicals when we go back is looking very slim. I don't think we'll be doing practicals in the near future. The earliest probably will be September, probably sometime probably closer to Christmas before we start doing proper practicals again uh, because of the social distancing measures. Now, um, today then, Energy resources. We're going to be focusing on power stations and um, fossil fuels in particular, but we're also going to be looking at nuclear power. So where does most of our energy needs come from? Now, I think I've talked about this before, about um, the electrical appliances around the house. We I came up with you guys to come up with a list of things. I and mean, there's like, you know, literally hundreds of electrical appliances in your house that requires electricity. So if you imagine every household around the country has got stuff plugged in, it needs electricity. So we need, we've got a huge demand, a big demand for our electricity and our energy needs. So, but where does it come from? Well, most of it comes from burning fossil fuels. So my starter question here is, what do I mean by this word commodity? And what is the most valuable commodity? Okay, so have a think about that. 
So what is a commodity? A commodity is anything that you can sell. Now, natural commodities then are things like gold, silver, platinum, uh, even coffee is a commodity. Uh, now, coffee is probably the world's second or third most valuable commodity, ironically, but um, what is the most valuable commodity then? That comes to our next killer question. Well, it used to be, probably right now it isn't, but it used to be a barrel of crude oil. So crude oil would be at one stage considered to be the most valuable commodity, a resource that you can sell for a price and it's useful to people. Now, what's the price of barrel of crude oil and how does it affect our lives? This is the killer question. It actually changes. Right now, it's at probably one of its lowest points in the last 20, 30 years, the, the price of a barrel of crude oil. A few years ago, probably within the last five years or so, the barrel of crude oil was over $100 a barrel. So it's actually $120 odd a barrel. So it's about £100 a barrel. So what we're talking about, a barrel of crude oil is, if you imagine your bathtub and you fill it, filled it up with bottles of, let's say, vegetable oil, sunflower oil, so that gunky oil, just glug, glug, glug. If you fill that all up, and if you imagine, uh, you know, a bottle of um, vegetable oil, that might be two pounds or something like that. And if you imagine you fill up your whole bathtub with that black gunky crude oil stuff, you're getting $100 or £100 or so a barrel. Now you think, well, that's... Hundred pounds is fairly quite a bit of money, but if you think about it, these countries like Saudi Arabia and those countries in the Middle East, they're pumping out loads and loads and loads and loads of crude oil, billions of barrels a year, you know, millions of barrels a day. So their economies are based on the price of crude oil. And recently, there's been a huge crash in the price of crude oil. It's come down from the, used to be in the hundreds, now it's been sitting around about the $50 barrel mark for, for a year or two. Now it's crashed below, you know, it's about $20 a barrel right now. Um, one of the uh, barrels has actually gone into negative figures, which is really bizarre and strange. If you want to do your research into that, how can you have something that costs negative price? That's a very strange concept. But the actual price isn't negative, because um, there's two prices that you have you got one that's called brent crude oil the price and then one's called wti which is the western texas intermediate tree now i am going on a slight tangent but the reason why it's a killer question is the price of crude oil affects our everyday lives because the price of crude oil affects the cost of transport why because most of our transport needs whether it's for us moving about from going from home to school from home to work transporting goods around the country depends on the price of petrol and the price of diesel. So the bus, all the trucks, the trains, the aeroplanes as well, the kerosene that comes from aeroplanes, all comes from crude oil because it gets separated out um, by fractional distillation and you get your different fuels that come from there um, that allows the transport of goods and services and people um, and that affects our everyday lives. Also the crude oil, plastics, comes from crude oil. So anything that's made that's got a plastic casing around the TV, the laptop, your mobile phones, anything that's got any kind of plastic components, crude oil is at some point along that line. And then transporting those goods, everything's price has got something to do with the cost of crude oil in there. So, but crude oil and natural gas uh, and our other fossil fuels, which is coal, um, are the main sources of our energy needs in the world. Next lesson, I'm gonna look at the renewables. Today I'm looking at the non-renewables, the ones that you can't replace. So, where does most of the energy come from to provide energy uh, for us? Well, it's the sun. Well, how does the sun link into all of that? It's because the sun's energy goes into plants, plants photosynthesize, and then they turn that any that the carbon dioxide and the water into carbohydrates those carbohydrates get stored and then the plant uses that for energy but then what happens what's the link well the link is this the sun's energy goes into plants the plants are producers and it's the beginning of the food chain the producer then passes on energy to a primary consumer which passes on to secondary consumer and then a tertiary consumer but what's happening then so the energy of the sun is locked away in living things but what do we know about living things? Living things will all eventually die at some point. So when they die, 
they can become buried and they can decompose or they can become fossilized if there's not enough oxygen and moisture and heat they can become uh, fossilized um, but the sun is so important because the sun's energy then will get into living things so biomass can give general energy our food natural gas coal and crude oil okay are the original energy the original energy source came from the sun okay via photosynthesis so that's from photosynthesis that will be from photosynthesis that was from originally from photosynthesis but then gets into the food chain the wind and the waves also because the sun's energy remember a few lessons back we talked about convection current that also gets generated by the sun now we've got them go back on all of these things are the energy originally came from the sun okay so it's the same slide as, as previous now if you guys have got powerpoint at home if you've got the latest one uh, these animations probably won't work because the new powerpoints uh, stop flash from working for some reason but if you've got the older version of powerpoint uh, so 2003 to 2007 or so 2009 the really old versions then any of the flash that you're going to see work, will work on your computer at home. So there's a lot of drag and drop activities that you can have a go at um, and questions and things that you'll see coming up. You can use those at home because I'm going to post the, uh, the PowerPoint slideshow on Share My Homework for you guys to do your work. So fossil fuels then, where do they come from? Or what are they? Well, ironically, fossil fuels were made from things that were living millions of years ago. So we're talking about 300 million years ago. So ironically, people weren't around when the things that died that are now making our fossil fuels. So it's taken 300 million years for us to come and uh, dig this all this stuff up. But what's happened? Well, fossil fuels, coal is made from dead trees and plants that die and then go underground, but don't decompose and become fossilized. And if I drag deeper under the ground, if I look under the sea, so you've got the sun there, and the plants are photosynthesizing, but in the seabed, what you've got is things die, and they sink to the bottom of the ocean, okay? And over time, millions and millions of years, they won't decompose, and they become fossilized. The fish and things have become oil and natural gas. The trees and things have become coal, and then we go along drilling and uh, digging up the coal from underground in the uh, coal mines. And then we use the coal to generate electricity in our power stations, which we'll look at in a second. So you've got oil and natural gas coming from the oil rigs from deep underground, from the seabed. And then the coal uh, as well from deep underground. All of that energy is used to make our electricity in modern day life. So coal oil and natural gas these are known as non-renewable energy resources which basically means they cannot be replaced once they're used they're used up and they're gone forever so once you burn them it takes millions of years so we're talking about 300 million years or so just to make that oil coal and gas so the, the rate at which we're burning it it can't be replenished at that same rate ironically there's a huge oil glut that i was talking about earlier because the whole world has come into lockdown because of the pandemic and at the time, Russia and Saudi Arabia were having a spat. These are known as OPEC countries. OPEC stands for oil producing, uh, exporting countries, which means they make more that they need themselves. So they export the rest of theirs to other countries around the world. And a lot of their money comes into their country because they sell the oil and the gas. But the price has come down so low that um, the news last week showed that uh, Saudi Arabia has actually put its VAT, the tax up on goods. Um, it's put it up recently to 5%, but it's in the last few days it's tripled that up to 15 percent which you might think well why is that a big problem because ours is 20 percent anyway in that country there's been no there's been no tax for the local people at all because they've had so much money coming in from the oil money that they've been looking after the people via this oil money but now that the price is so low they don't produce as much money coming into their country so it's going to make those countries unstable economically uh, which will cause problems. So how does the uh, how is coal produced then? So coal now this you don't need to know in your syllabus, but it's useful just to know for your uh, general knowledge. Coal then was made from dead trees millions of years ago. Like I mentioned that number three hundred million years ago, the trees died. Now remember the trees used up the sunlight via photosynthesis and stored that energy in its carbohydrates, in its sugars, and in its like 
tree trunks and the cells and all that kind of stuff, the cellulose to make cell walls. Eventually those trees died and they got buried under swampy, muddy places. Now, usually bacteria decomposes things, but if the bacteria doesn't have enough oxygen in there and the heat and the pressure then over millions of years, because you'll get sedimentation, lots and lots of layers keep coming on top of it, on top of it, on top of it, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper underground, the heat and the pressure would have uh, fossilized the tree trunks and it would have turned into coal. And then millions of years later, 300 million years later, we came along and uh, discovered that there's coal underground. We drilled it all up, dug it all up in these coal mines and then brought it all up as these little black rocks, okay, like a piece of coal. You crush it all up and then you can burn it because it gives it a larger surface area when you crush it into like a fine powder. And that's what they use in a power station, in a coal-fired power station. And most of our power station in this country used to be coal-powered. So, coal is formed millions of years ago where the trees died, fell to the bottom of the swamps. Over time, they got covered by mud and rock. Over millions of years, due to the high temperatures and pressure and the lack of oxygen, the bacteria can't decompose them, the trees became fossilised, forming coal. How does it look for oil then? Well, oil was actually made from dead sea creatures from millions of years ago. So there we got sea creatures swimming around and again, all living things die eventually. Now, just like this PowerPoint, it's died. Yeah, there you go, PowerPoint's not working. So, um, oh, there you go, it's working. So the, fi the fish, and the sea creatures would have died. They would have fallen to the bottom of the ocean. And over time, they would have got covered with sediment, just like the trees. And millions and millions and millions of years later, the heat and the pressure would have turned the dead fish and the sea creatures into crude oil and natural gas. And over time, then, you can see that the gas gets trapped under this rock. It's like a hard rock called cap rock. And, uh, uh, it gets trapped in there and then when the oil rigs come along and drill under the seabed what happens is that pressure from the gas squirts all that oil up and you get this thing they used to call it black gold meaning that gold obviously is precious and it's, it was black gooey stuff that looked no had no value and when they realized that all the stuff they can do from it when they first discovered it they didn't really know what to do with it so but then when they realized all the stuff they could do with crude oil it became a valuable commodity the world's most valuable commodity Okay, so your car's driving down the street. Well, what's driving your car? And this is the Tesla and it's a running on a battery, electric. Then it's dead fish oil from millions of years ago. Well, that's basically what's driving your cars. Your cars are you know, running on the petrol, which came from sea creatures from millions of years ago. So millions of years ago, plankton and other sea creatures died to the bottom of the sea. They got covered by mud and rock over millions of years. The heat and the pressure, the high heat, turned them into crude oil and natural gas and then we came along and drilled it all up okay so that's that so there's our, uh, our oil rig releasing our oil now there's a little activity that you guys can have a go at okay so on Sharma homework I'll post the PowerPoint so you can have a, a go at that and here is the power station right so how how does the power station work? So you need the water to turn to steam. The steam turns the turbine. So how do I heat that water up? It's the crude oil and the natural gas or the, the coal. So you burn a fuel, those fossil fuels, you burn them, they generate heat. And just like the hot water in a kettle, the water will turn to steam, the steam will rise, go through this nozzle, will spin the turbine, the turbine will spin the generator, as you'll see the turbine starts spinning. The generator will spin because the drive shaft there, the generator is just literally a magnet and some wires and that will induce a current and the current will go into the national grid and bring the electricity to your home. The excess water there will come out the cooling towers uh, and that's those clouds are not get a smoke, they're actually clouds of just water vapor that needs to cool down so you can recycle that water. Now, the problem with this though, this boiler, you're burning the fossil fuels. The fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide as a waste gas, and also if there's sulfur compounds in there, it will produce sulfur dioxide. 
The sulfur dioxide is going to lead to things like acid rain and the carbon dioxide is going to lead to things like global warming and climate change because of the greenhouse effect, which I'll come back to in a second. So the, th the good thing about fossil fuels is they, you can replenish them um, really quickly, as in you can just dr drill and get some all the time very, very quickly. So it's an easy, reliable source of energy and it's, um, it's relatively cheap. Okay, so it's $100 a barrel of crude oil. It's relatively cheap to set up and buy coal and, and, and burn and you can sort of get it off and going fairly straightforward and quickly. It produces, per gram, it produces lots and lots of energy as well. So it's very, very efficient. So it will give me lots and lots of energy because we're going to be comparing these guys to the renewable resources on our next lesson. So they've got their advantages. The main disadvantage is that they're going to run out. These fossil fuels took 300 million years to make. We are burning them at a rate so fast that within the next century, all of them will be, would have run out because we are having to go around discovering them in new wells and new uh, places where we can find these, um, you know, the exploration to find these resources underground. And they have to use uh, technology like seismic technology to scan underground under the rocks and things to find the right place. And it costs millions and billions to discover the stuff, but then they have to sell it as well. So have a go at this one as well. So that's just an activity. It should work if you've got Flash Player working on your computer. Now, how is a nuclear power station different to a normal uh, coal-fired or gas-fired or oil-fired power station? Well, they're exactly the same. The only difference is this. Where you've got your boiler, instead of heating it up by burning a fossil fuel, you've got a nuclear reactor instead. Now, a nuclear reactor is very, very, very efficient. You only need this much nuclear fuel to keep that powering for probably about 50 years or so. So you only need literally a few kilograms of the nuclear reactor, the nuclear fuel. Now the two fuels that the nuclear reactor uses, you need to know this for next time's uh, recall quiz, uranium and plutonium. Now they do use those in submarines as well as a nuclear reactor to power the submarine because submarines don't have battery power to run them. They don't have a, a a normal engine like you do on a car because you'd see gas have to be the exhaust gas have to go somewhere so you don't see bubbles of water coming up from a nuclear uh, from a from a submarine they're powered by nuclear reactors so a nuclear reactor then generates heat that heat will turn that water into steam just like before that steam will turn the turbine the turbine will spin the generator the generator will generate electricity and enters the national grid but what's the disadvantage of that well the advantage is you don't need much fuel and the fuel will last decades so they're relatively clean. There's no carbon dioxide, so it's not going to lead to climate change or global warming. So this sounds amazing. So why don't we do more of this? Well, in France, about half or more of their, I think it's more than that, of their power is actually generated by nuclear power, whereas in our country, it's only a small percentage. One of the main reasons is a nuclear reactor, uh, you have lots of safety measures around it, but if one of those decided to explode, which it did in, um, in the Ukraine, in a place called Chernobyl, so you might want to do research on that. In Chernobyl, the Ukrainian uh, power station exploded and caused mass devastation. And recently, in the last 10 years or so, in a Japanese uh, city called Fukushima, their nuclear reactors, one of those exploded and caused lots of mass devastation as well. So what, if a nuclear reactor explodes, there's lots and lots of radioactive waste. And that waste can be extremely hazardous because it's radioactive. It can cause radiation sickness. Uh, causes cancer like leukemia things like that and living things all living things whether it's plants and animals and humans will die from radiation poisoning so um, they are very very good but they have got their issues as well and once you get the radioactive waste and let's say it's all been safe you need to store the nuclear waste that stays radioactive for thousands of years but it's not radioactive enough for, the power, for, for it to work in the reactor to power your power station, so what we call spent fuel rods, then they're useless for the power station, but they're still radioactive for thousands of years. So you have to dis dispose of them very, very safely. They usually melt them down. Um, they uh, put it into, uh, melt it with glass and mix it in with some concrete or put it into these huge steel canisters and then take them to a deep uh, com uh, commissioning, decommissioning plant 
uh, treatment centre like in Sellafield and then they'll put it deep, 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 deep underground. Um, so stops like bad people, like terrorists coming and deciding to steal it, so they'll have a lot of security because they can make dirty bombs from them. So I don't mean a dirty bomb as in a bomb explodes and poo flies everywhere, I don't mean like that, as in dirty bombs as in it'll be release radioactive material and then make people sick from the radiation sickness after. So that's your nuclear uh, power station. So here's another little activity you guys can have a go at if your flash works at home. Um, now, the problems then, we talked about the problems. The nuclear power stations, the problem is radioactive waste. The advantage is though, it produces loads of energy very reliably for decades and it's clean, other than the fact that you've got radioactive waste. There's no carbon dioxide, so you don't get any, uh, there's no acid rain from nuclear power station. There's no carbon dioxide, so you get no global warming and you get no, um, uh, climate change effects from a nuclear power station. The cost of setting up a nuclear power station is extremely expensive. You need to pay highly skilled people to run that nuclear power station, not Homer Simpson, because he's not highly skilled, obviously. Um, and then it's the end, the life cycle of that power station might be 50 years. At the end of that 50 years, you need to decommission that power station. So you need to break it down in a very secure, uh, environmentally friendly way, which is ex very expensive. So because uh, you have to use robots to cut it all down because all of the materials around it will become radioactive too, will become contaminated by the radiation. So um, fossil fuels though lead to this global warming. Why? Because they produce carbon dioxide. What happens with that carbon dioxide? If you increase the amount of carbon dioxide, the sun's rays comes down and it reflects, most of it just reflects back into space. But because it warms up the earth, and then the infrared, remember we talked about infrared radiation, will go back into space. But the more carbon dioxide you got in the atmosphere, the more the carbon dioxide bounces the radiation back, the infrared radiation, back into Earth, and it gets trapped, just like the heat energy in the greenhouse, the sun's energy gets trapped inside that greenhouse, okay, and it gets really hot inside there. The Earth's atmosphere starts to do that. It starts to warm up more than what it should be, which then causes catastrophic effects like uh, the ice caps melting, like um, the polar bears got nowhere to get food because they'll have to swim out further out into sea, then they, they run out of energy and then they die. Sea levels rise. Sea levels rise, you get mass flooding because it adds to the amount of water in the system. So when we get um, the water cycle, you get flash flooding in places like the UK, all around the world, like in Bangladesh and places like that. So you get mass devastation, like you get things like droughts in certain parts of the world. It's called the El Nino effect. And in some parts of the world, you get uh, flooding. So uh, it's not good. And this is down to the levels of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, like methane, um, and like the, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere as well. So fossil fuels then will run out one day. We got approximately two to 300 years of uh, coal left. We probably got somewhere between 50 to 100 years of oil and gas left. Okay, so in our lifetimes that will run out, hence why we need more cars, uh, electric cars, um, like Teslas, but there are other companies available, not that I like Elon Musk at all, but um, there are other companies out there that uh, make electric cars. So there's the key points and some exam questions for you guys to have a go at. Any issues, please get back to me on Show My Homework or you can contact me through the YouTube channel. Uh, hopefully you've learned something uh, about fossil fuels, non-renewable energy resources. We've looked at um, the energy demands, why we need it. We've got nuclear power. I didn't really mention biofuels. Biofuels are just um, vegetation, so plants. We can uh, use plants to produce things like ethanol. If you've used a process called fermentation, they did that back in Brazil when the oil prices shot up back in the 70s and 80s. They started to actually cut down their uh, forests and make more farmland to grow uh, crops that actually were fermented to make alcohol. That alcohol then is used in the petrol tanks or cars. They mix it with petrol so they water it down basically with ethanol uh, as a biofuel. The thing with that is though, it's carbon neutral. The amount of carbon dioxide that went into it while it was growing and you burn it, that produces the carbon dioxide again. So the amount of net effect is zero. So there's no extra carbon dioxide being added. Whereas with fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas, it's taking 300 million years to lock away that carbon and then you burn it and you're releasing what took 300 million years to make, you're releasing it within a century or so. So it's you know, pumping out loads and loads and loads of CO2 into the atmosphere and affecting uh, our climate. We talked about uh, uranium and plutonium in our nuclear power stations. 
but it releases much, much more energy per kilogram than any fossil fuels. Sacks and sacks in this whole room, if I filled up this whole room with a bag of coal, that still wouldn't produce as much uh, energy as this much uranium. Okay, so, and biofuels are renewable that we just talked about, and you can get things like methane and ethanol to generate that electricity. But these, again, are not technically, um, they, they, well, they're technically renewable, uh, uh, but we'll, so we're gonna talk about more of them in our next lesson. So today we talked about uh, non-renewables. Next time I'll see you, uh, it will be renewable energy resources. I uh, hope you've learned something today and I uh, hope you guys are all well. Oh, I nearly forgot. I need to give you a virtual high five. If you got all five questions right, that's fantastic. You can't buy these in the shops. Virtual high five from me and I'll see you next time.